last day of the year, my accountant came and said, yeah, hey, by the way, uh, yeah, we need to run this like $100,000 tax p- bill. And I was like, uh, you need to warn me about that kind of stuff a little bit ahead of time, right? I managed, I have a cash flow projection and this was not in it and like, that's not okay. So I was like, all right, let's pay this bill and then we'll figure it out after. All right. Once they came back online, we, we looked at it and we looked at it a little bit more detail. They came back with an estimate that said, well, we're going to be negative $125,000 by mid March. And I was like, I don't understand how that's possible, but it freaked me out, obviously. And then a couple days later, they were like, oh no, it's going to be like minus $165,000 by like late March. And I was like, shit, they're never exactly right. And I'd rather have them err on showing that I'll have lower amounts of cash than I end up having. But still like negative 165K is like, nah, it's not really workable, right? Um, so honestly, I was like terrified when I heard the news first. I was like, shit, uh, I was shook by it. And this triggered something deep in me that was more than just about the cash flow situation. You know, how do we address this? This is a problem to be dealt with, to be solved, right? It's not something to panic over, but my unconscious mind that comes online at night was like, yeah, like, you know, panic. And then I I, I kept really not being able to make any progress on that emotional side. Until the day before, I was out walking my dog with my wife at night, and then we were talking about this, and she told me how one of her mentors had talked to her about digging, you know, asking herself, what's underneath? What's underneath? And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm already doing that. Um, but it still kind of sat, sat with me. So the next morning when I woke up, I was like, okay, all right, let me ask that question. What's underneath? What's underneath? What's underneath? And suddenly it was like broke through a layer of that emotion into feelings of grief, like deep, deep grief. And then like rage. I was like, whoa, that was interesting. Where did that come from? It was like, all right, stay with it. All right, cool. This is, this is good. I keep going. What's underneath? What's underneath this? And then I met my victim persona. The victim is that part of us is like, oh, it's someone else's fault. Like you're to blame. This is to blame. Oh, it's like, oh, I can't, I can't. Arguing for our limitations, arguing for our problems. You know that situation when you have a problem, you ask someone's like, ah, I don't, I'm like really, oh, I'm so pissed at, I'm really frustrated with this thing. And then they're like, yeah, why don't we just do this? And then you start arguing for why you can't do that. And any kind of solution that anybody gives you, you just start arguing for why that can't be done, why that's not a good solution, right? That's your victim persona. So I met that guy again, but it was like a new version of him. It was like much more clear and tangible. And I could see, holy crap, I could really see how much I'd been playing victim. Like, fuck me. All right, this is awesome. I love this, right? It's so beautiful when you, when you really see those parts of yourself that is holding you back and you can just be like, oh my God, I fucking see it. Great to see everybody. Welcome to another edition of Unfiltered Live. Today I have a big story, a big story to share about something that happened in the past couple of weeks that um, I think you guys are going to find super interesting. It's a little bit vulnerable. Actually, it's it's more than a little bit vulnerable. I am um, investing everything back into the company. So we're we're doing some incredible things right now on uh, on the product side with Simplero and, um, we're building out some really amazing things on the coaching side. We're also building out some really cool things on the marketing site side. Um, I don't know if you guys saw the, the webinar that we, that we, uh, did and sent to y'all, uh, gotten some really great feedback on that. We're putting on a summit in February. So you all should hear about that today or tomorrow. Um, there it's happening on February 16 and 17. We've got some incredible speakers there, uh, just an amazing lineup. So there was just a few of the things that are happening on the marketing side. So bottom line is at this point I'm investing into the company, right? We have X, X amount of dollars coming in every month in revenue and we don't have any outside funding. Uh, it's all coming from revenue or um, from like money that I put into it. It's like, that's the only source of, of cash that we have. So we're not VC funded. We don't have any other investors or anything like that. 
you know, instead of taking profit out of the company, I've actually been at, in, in recent months uh, putting some money into the company because I want to be able to invest more in product for a variety of reasons. And, you know, not just in product, but in, in product and marketing and, you know, team and everything else. I think there's an incredible opportunity in the market right now. Um, we can get into that, like with ClickFunnels change, switching between, you know, their old version and 2.0, and there's some confusion there. Uh, Gumroad just increased their prices. Teachable just did a price hike that's causing some people to look for elsewhere. So I think that there's some, some really interesting opportunities. I want to be able to capitalize on that. And it involves all of marketing and product and everything else. And growth always costs money up front, right? You pay money to grow so that you can make money over the long term. Anyway, all of that to say that we've been running, you know, a pretty tight ship here lately in terms of, of cash flow reserves. So what happened was that over New Year's, my, my accountant came and said, yeah, hey, by the way, uh, last day of the year, there's like, yeah, we need to run this like $100,000 tax bill. And I was like, uh, you need to warn me about that kind of stuff a little bit ahead of time, right? I manage, I have a cash flow projection and this was not in it and like, that's not okay. And so um, I was like, okay, my, my finances team that runs that cash flow and, and other things, they're actually over in the Philippines. So they're asleep. And so I didn't really have time to, to get them online and, and do anything. So I was like, let's pay this bill um, and then we'll figure it out after. All right, so pay the bill. And then uh, once they come back, came back online, we, we looked at it and we looked at it a little bit more detail. They came back with an estimate that said, well, we're going to be negative $125,000 by mid-March. And I was like, that's, I don't understand how that's possible, but it freaked me out, obviously. And then a couple of days later, they were like, oh no, it's going to be like minus $165,000 by like late March. And I was like, shit. Um, and mind you, like these are, these are conservative estimates and, and things are changing on the ground and like some months revenue is higher, some times it's lower, right? So we keep these kind of conservative. And I, I know that they're not, they're not, you know, exact, they're never right. They're not, never exactly right. And I'd rather have them err on, you know, showing that I'll have lower ca amounts of cash than I, than I end up having, right? So, but still like negative 165k is like that's nah, not you really workable right um so honestly i was like terrified i woke up when i heard the news first i was like shit uh i was shook by it and this was this triggered something deep in me that was more than just about the cash flow situation so anyway so i had i had a, a couple of days i had like a, a yeah a few days where i'd wake up every morning at 4.30 and just like in a panic, like fear. And I know enough to like, not like, I'm like, okay, this is like, feel the feelings here, right? At daytime, I just be like, okay, what do we got to do? Here's, you know, how, 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 you know, how do we address this? This is a problem just to be, to be dealt with, to be solved, right? It's not something to panic over, but my unconscious mind that comes online at night was like, yeah, like, you know, panic. And so I'd like, I'd have that panic. Um, I'd be like lying there awake for, you know, a couple hours and just like feeling as best I could. And then I'd get out of bed and get up and get on with my day and like, you know, deal with the situation. And then next morning, same thing, 4.30, wake up, same thing. I, I kept really not being able to make any progress on that emotional side until the day before I flew to Vegas a couple of weeks ago. So this was like Thursday, two weeks ago. Um, on Wednesday, the day before I was out walking my dog with my wife at night. And then she told me how something that really helped her on the last on her, like recently was one of her mentors that said, like, talk to her about, you know, asking herself what's underneath, what's underneath. And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm already doing that. I mean, that is what I'm doing. Um, but it still kind of sat, sat with me. So the next morning when I woke up three hour time difference, but still woke up at 430 that morning in Vegas. I was like, okay, all right, let me ask that question. What's underneath? What's underneath? What's underneath? It was really, it was really powerful. It actually really made a difference. So like suddenly it was like broke through a layer of that emotion into feelings of grief, like deep, deep grief. And then like rage. And I was like, whoa, that was interesting. Where did that come from? It was like, all right, stay with it. All right, 
cool. This is, this is good. Right? It's like very different from like that kind of surface level, which was a little bit more, it wasn't really clear. It was more like, oh, just like kind of shaking. So, all right, rage, grief, also some fear, but like much more tangible kind of fear. I was like, okay, cool, good, good, good. Keep going. What's underneath? What's underneath this? And then I met my victim. We all have a victim persona. The victim is that part of us is like, oh, it's someone else's fault. Like you're, you're to blame. This is to blame. Oh, it's like, oh, I can't, I can't. Arguing for our limitations, arguing for our problems. You're like, you know that, that situation when someone comes to you to, you have a problem, you ask someone's like, ah, I don't, I like really, oh, I'm so pissed at, I'm really frustrated with this thing. And then they're like, yeah, why don't we just do this? And then you start arguing for why you can't do that. And any kind of solution that anybody gives you, you just start arguing for why that can't be done, why that's not a good solution, right? That's your victim persona. So I met that guy again, but in, it was like a new version of him. It was like much more clear and tangible. And I could see, holy crap, like I got really good at programming and computers because I was really scared of people at both at home nobody seemed to understand or see or really connect with anyone um at school i was being bullied people would say stuff and it would make me feel really hurt and i was like oh i don't like this so i drew into my own little world of computers and books and that kind of thing because those that that though that world that reality i could control and nobody would say anything that would make me feel bad. And I was like, crap, this is that old, old victim again, where when it comes to, you know, customer acquisition, some of the challenges that I've had on the team side, like that's, those are all people things. Those are all people challenges. No wonder that like building a customer acquisition engine has been a struggle for me if I've been in my victim around that. So I was like, oh my God, crap. Like I could really see how much I'd been playing victim around that whole game. I'm like, fuck me. All right, this is awesome. I love this, right? It's so beautiful when you, when you really see those parts of yourself that is holding you back and you can just be like, oh my God, I fucking see it now. One of my mentors, um, a guy named Gay Hendricks, some of you may know of him. He has a saying, which is, any problem that you've had for more than a few months, you're committed to that problem being there. Whether it's a business issue or a relationship issue or a health issue or whatever it is. Like if you have that problem and it's been there for a few months, you're committed to it. What I saw here was it's the victim in me. That's the part of me that's committed to having these challenges the fucking victim. So I was like, this is amazing. And then I kept digging. I'm like, what's underneath this? What's underneath this? And then I hit a spot that just like, boom, it smacked me like right in the face. And I was like, Whoa! and I could just feel these tears coming, streaming into me. Like, Whoa, I was really, like really emotional. It was this feeling that I don't matter, that I have no value no worth whatsoever and it's crazy i've talked about feeling uh, feelings un, of unworthiness before but i've never felt it like this it was just so clear in that instant and what was crazy about it is that it only stayed with me for like seconds just a few seconds and then it kind of vanished i tried to like okay stay with it this stay with this like bring it in again and i i couldn't it was you know evaporated and at that point, I was, I was awake and I was like, all right, let me get up. It was like 6.30 or something, like, time to get up. I think, I think it was like 5 or something, but I had a meeting at 6 o'clock. So I was like, all right, time, time to get up here. But it was really, I mean, just it was completely game changing for me to really feel that. And then from that moment, I haven't had that fear yet. From then, like, it was like, great. Like, now we're just in, in practical mode of what we're going to do. So no early morning wake-ups, that was it. So I really believe that, that when we have those situations where we feel these, these fears or these whatever feelings we have, they're an invitation to, to really go into the feeling and dig deeper and, and really feel it. And this new 
phrase for me of just saying, asking myself that what's underneath rather than what I've been doing before has been just like, all right, let me like let go of my resistance. Let me feel this. Let me ah, breathe into it, allow it to expand, like really get into the feeling that kind of stuff. But that that's that's working as well. But this one was like, what's underneath that question opened a new door for me. So, you know, I think the lesson here is just trying different angles and different phrases and different like angles of attack. Think kind of think of it like like a little child sitting there like really locked up because they've had this feeling and like they've been beaten up and nobody's listened to them and like you got to figure out finagle sort of way into this part of yourself so that it's willing to open up and it trusts you enough that you you're not going to berate it again to open up but that was just the morning later that day i was in vegas for a meeting with this mastermind group that i'm in called founders board bryson and i came down there a little bit late because we were doing the show and they're just about to embark on this round circle exercise where you know they gather five people or you know four or five people around you know, at a table and then you would take turns to to bring your biggest challenge to the group and and learn from the other people in the group and so Bryce and I came down there, we joined separate groups, just join in. And then finally it was my turn to present a challenge. And I had, I was so ashamed and embarrassed about this whole cash flow situation that I considered whether I should just pick another topic and just like, you know, all right, you know, I have plenty of other challenges that I could bring up. I'm like something a little less, a little more safe, a little less vulnerable. But I was like, yeah, fuck it. Like, this is my challenge, right? This is, this is my chance to be courageous and vulnerable. And so I just opened up, I was like, Hey, here's the situation exactly like I told you guys. And I don't know what the fuck to do. Um, what are some ways that I can generate some cash quickly from, you know, the resources that are, that I have, or that I can, um, acquire some money some other way. And this was, it was so good because these other people, they were like, yeah, this has happened to me many times. This is pretty normal. <laughs> like, you know, like every so often I'll have challenges meeting payroll and I'll need to get a loan some places. And they had ideas for different places to make money. One, one guy was recommending a company called pipe.com. You plug in your Stripe and you plug in your, your bank and your QuickBooks and things of that nature. And then they come back with an offer. Uh, Stripe Capital is another one. I'd actually, actually already started looking in them since we process most of our payments through Stripe. Um, they offer loans. And one guy had this trick of, of credit card stacking where you get uh, different credit cards that have 0% annual rate APR uh, interest rate and for a, a, a period of time. And then you can, you can pay a percentage to get that money out as cash and then you can find other cards with the same. So eventually you can roll them over. It costs, costs like 2% to get it out as cash, 4% to roll it over to another card. So you can actually kind of keep rolling over the credit card. So that's an option. So those were just some of the suggestions that they had. So it was really nice to have a group of other entrepreneurs be like, hey, like to just take this thing out of it. It was like, there's no, there's no shame or embarrassment about this. It's just like, hey, like a, a, a thing, right? Like I know that, you know, those kinds of things are not my strength, which is why I need the right people on my team to help help with that kind of stuff. I mean, I've never run out of cash ever in my you know, 20, 30 years in business it never happened. So I'm not, I don't suck at it, but it's definitely not my, my zone of genius, but it's really nice to have that reflected back to me and, and, and just like normalizing the idea of using debt financing when that's needed, which I had some, some stigma about like I'm debt free. I don't owe money to anybody. I don't, I don't own a dime anywhere but obviously leveraging debt can be really really smart for you know when you know what you're doing then what i also did was i reached out to one of my old buddies someone i've known for a few years his name is nathan so i reached out to him because i seem to remember that he did something specifically for SaaS companies software as a service businesses like mine where he did funding for those using debt instead of equity because what a lot of tech companies do is they will take money from VCs or other investors or, you know, sometimes private equity in exchange for equity, right? So you sell parts of your company in exchange for this cash, which is a very, very expensive way to get money versus if you just take on a loan and then you pay the interest on that. But you, so, you know, eventually you'll pay that back. You'll pay some money, something for that but you still own 100% of your company. 
So that's what he does with his company called FounderPath. So I looked into that and I, I gave him a, a buzz um, and then we hopped on the phone and he walked me through it. Let me start by saying, so I looked at Stripe Capital, they'll lend us $250,000 like, like this. Uh, Pipe was the other one that was mentioned. They are offering to loan us like $200,000 and change. Um, also just instantly. This founder path came back after plugging in all the things with an offer of $2 million, $2 million. I'm like, that's that just like, it opened something in me all of a sudden of like, huh? Cause like, there's no question. There's lots of things that I would love to do if we had more money. So we are constantly threading that needle of how much I can invest back into the company. And I would love to invest a lot more if we had it. So all of a sudden it was like 2 million. What could we do with 2 million, right? We could do marketing, customer acquisition, right? We could do product, hire more engineers, designers, build more product faster, which would help with the customer acquisition if we build the right things. And we could also do acquisitions. One of the most effective ways to grow is to buy other companies or buy assets from other companies, right? Maybe there's another company that we can buy that wouldn't cost a lot, but they have a lot of our customers already because they are offering some complementary product or, or maybe there's a Facebook group that we can buy, or maybe there's a, a podcast that we can buy that already has an audience. And now we can, can plug into that and they have our audience, the audience that we want, right? So acquisitions is a really interesting thing that you can do with cash. And so this opportunity, all of a sudden of 2 million, just opened the door for me to like, crap, what can we do, right? Like a really key hire might easily cost, like a good head of marketing will cost easily 200K. And then a recruiter fee on top of that would probably be, you know, 50k if not 75k to a good recruiter to find someone like that right that's a lot of cash some of those things are really expensive but but if we know that there's a path like if we can take two million in loan pay interest on that and convert that into you know an increased monthly recurring revenue of two hundred thousand, right so a tenth of the loan two million loan two hundred thousand mrr now that makes sense to make that trade and so it just opened the door for me to, to all these other possibilities that I didn't even think were, a pot, were an option. So that was amazing. That, that alone is a game changer. And then on top of that, so I was on the phone with Nathan. Uh, he has an event coming up in New York in March for SaaS companies where, that I was already going to. I bought the ticket a while back on the phone. It just as I was about to hang up, I said, all right, I'll see you in March at the event. And he's like, yeah, are you coming? I'm like, yeah, I'm coming great. We should, would you be willing to keynote? We would left, I'd love to have you as a speaker. I'm like, for sure. I'm, I'm currently working on getting out more actively as a speaker. And so he's like, all right, cool. Like, what would you talk about? And we chatted about that. And so now I'm going to be speaking at that event also. So I got a speaking gig out of it as well. The bottom line here, right? The takeaway is that this situation that seemed really terrifying and scary and made me feel all these, you know, painful emotions ended up being a massive breakthrough. I, I can really feel in the two weeks that's passed since how big that shift was around the victim. Like, this is not the first time I've known of my victim. Those um, who've been following me for a while know, knows that it's one of my favorite topics is to talk about the victim persona and the whole drama triangle of victim and villain and rescuer and how that affects all of us and our relationships and all that stuff. It's not my first time around that, that rodeo, but this is at a completely different level and it's impacted my relationships. It's impacted my marriage already where I'm like, oh fuck, I see, I suddenly see all these places in my life where I've been playing victim. I'm like, let's fucking stop doing that. Or at least start acknowledging that that's what I'm doing, right? This has been a game changer with, with my wife now because a bunch of places where I was doing that and, and where we were both doing victim and then like our victims would, would battle. I'm like, you know, yeah, I'm just being about, I'm just in my victim right now. And I just say that out loud. And then she's like, you know what, actually I am too. And then we can laugh about it. And then it completely takes the kind of takes the tension out of that situation. So already that's been a complete game changer, you know, yet another story and probably the most intense one that I can remember that I've had in recent memory of, 
how these painful situations turn into the biggest fucking breakthroughs. So once again, learning that lesson. That's amazing, man. So do you think you could have been in that place to think and observe the new possibilities and opportunities that you were presented had you not confronted um, your victim persona? Like, would you have been in the right, would you have been able to even look at this as a possibility and see what is, you know, what you can do with it if you were still trapped in victim? It's a good question. Yeah, maybe, maybe not, right? The thing when you're in victim is what do you need? What's your need when you're in victim? What you need is unsolvable problem. That's the psychological need that you have when you're in victim. So that's why we end up arguing so strongly for our problems, for our limitations, because that is, that's, that's what keeps that going. That's what that needs. So I'm not sure I've been able to, I, I would have been able to hear it the same way if that hadn't happened. I also don't know. It's like, it's funny to spec speculate these things, right? Because I really believe that as we make those inner shifts, you know, the entirety of reality ch changes, right? <laughs> like it's kind of like the, the time space continuum, which is like, you know, those, those uh, uh, changes just like radiates out and impacts everything. So I guess it's unknowable, um, but I can really, I can see back to so many conversations I've had with people where I was arguing for, you know, why we couldn't do this, that, or the other thing when it comes to customer acquisition or like for years, I was so opinionated on like running paid ads. I was like, oh, I hate Facebook and I don't want to pay those fuckers. And like, ah, oh, this shouldn't be like, where I had so many opinions on paid ads. Like, well, if you do something that's worthwhile, that's interesting, then people are going to find it and they're going to, they're going to, you know, you know, you shouldn't have to pay the, the tax of, of paid ads and yada, yada, yada. It's like, it's stupid. It's just a tool that's available to you. If you want to use it, use it. If you don't want to use it, don't use it. I definitely prefer to pay partners and my friends and other people, uh, my customers, right. To refer be customers to us, than pay Facebook and, you know, Zuckerberg and BlackRock and whoever Vanguard and main street and whoever else owns Facebook right? Meta, but they're an option. It's, a, you know, this is a business. Let's use the tools that are available to us, including financing, right? Um, I was speaking to someone last night. So I'm here in Austin for a dinner, a friend of mine in Tim Francis, he does um, dinners he calls Skyline Dinner. So that was last night. And uh, one of the people who were there, um, a guy named Tom, Tom Shipley, I've, I've known him for a couple of years. He does amazing stuff. He builds these roll-up companies. Um, right now he's building a company that's a, a conglomerate, a roll up of agencies. So they're acquiring one to two agencies a month to roll up into this like master, master agency, but they're letting each, anyways, there's lots of how they do it. But bottom line is like, they could never do that without outside capital, right? Somebody has to fund that, uh, those acquisitions. So totally legit and cool. David says a key for me is to recognize victimhood when it rears its ugly head. <laughs> yeah. Many don't even recognize it. Yeah, and I would say it totally, right? And that was the thing for me too. Even though I was totally aware of all the victim stuff, I wasn't seeing it in myself. And we just can't, we can't read the label from inside the bottle, right? So, so it, it's, it can be so hard to really see, it, especially hard when we're in it. It's like, I can kind of feel the energy that I'm probably a victim right now, if I'm a little bit honest, but it's really, it can be really hard to see and feel. And also like, I would reframe when you, that when you say, like when the victimhood rears its ugly head, I would reframe it. Maybe the victim is just cute, right? It's just a little hurt, little, you know, boy part of ourselves, like embrace it and, you know, maybe laugh at it and, 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 and chuckle a little bit, right? We don't have to be so be afraid of it or, or, or take it all, all too seriously. Um, it's not that scary, but it can definitely wreak havoc. Just like if you had a, a kid, if you had a, a four-year-old try to run your business or your, your marriage, right? That's not a recipe for success. Doesn't mean that it's, that four-year-old is ugly. It's just like, he's not really equipped for that. Jeff says, I had a job that I felt I was a victim in because they wouldn't promote me. I felt used. I realized since I chose to be there, I can choose to leave. Exactly. Started my own business and dropped the victim act. Became very successful three years after. I went out on my own. That's amazing. Exactly right. Like, I think so much of, of you know, employer-employee relationship is just like, 
replaying childhood drama, right? Like replaying childhood stuff. And, you know, you're projecting your, your mom and dad onto your boss and your boss is projecting whatever onto, onto you. And, and one of my mentors is named, and I guy named Steve Chandler. He said, most people come to work looking to be reparented. Most people are looking to be reparented by their boss because their parents screwed it up and now they're hoping that, that their boss is going to do a better job. I think there's a lot of truth to that. So Janice says, I really like the part where you went deeper, start saying with a feeling, asking what's underneath. Yeah, it was, that was powerful. It really was. And it was funny because I thought I was doing it. But just my wife saying that because you know, our mentor had said that to her um, you know, a few weeks before. She had a, a, a back injury and so had to go over to Copenhagen to get that fixed with, with body SDS and, and they really, really helped. And that also triggered a lot of emotional stuff. Like, you know, our, our physical body is totally tied into all these things, right? It's one of the things that, that I've experienced too is, you know, when I do exercise and I get to, to exercise some parts of my body that haven't really moved for a while, all, a lot of times that will trigger some emotion to come up. <laughs> yeah, take away, are you committed to being a victim? Yeah. Well, right. That's a good point, Shveta. We mostly are. I mean, whenever we're in victim, we tend to be fairly committed to being in that victim until we get awareness on it and choose otherwise. And it can be really satisfying. I still remember the first time I really, really saw my victim I was in 2014, um, had recently moved from India to New York. So Trip, I was coaching with Trip back in 2014. And I was about to write this, I was trying to write this long form sales copy for a coaching offer. And whenever I sat down to write it, these feelings of like, well, who am I? Like, I'm so, I'm still struggling with self-worth issues. Who, how can I coach anybody? I'm not, I have nothing to offer. I'm, you know, I'm no good, la, 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 like all that stuff. And then I just sit there and like in my own misery and I wouldn't be able to write anything at all and then i'd go back home and i'd next day i'd go out to the coffee shop and i'd sit down to write this thing and i'd the same damn thing over again and he was like what are you getting out of doing this right what's the positive payoff for you of going down this path and i'm like well i'm not doing it to myself i don't like it's just it comes it's because my parents didn't love me it's because like all these different things and he's like yeah i yeah, know i think you're getting something out of this like what could it be and i just could not see it I could not see it. It's a question that I love asking people. And usually you just get some like left brain mental chatter, blah, 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 blah. Like most people are, it's really hard for them to go there where they psychologically connect with that right part of their brain where they can really see, oh fuck, I'm doing this for this payoff. It makes me feel what, right? And so he was like, I think what you get out of it is you get to not take responsibility for what you want. You get to cop out of taking responsibility for what you actually do here. And I was like, at first I fought him. I was like, I don't see that. I understand what you're saying, la, 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 la. Like, and then I was like, okay, what if he's right? What if he's right? And so I forget if it was on the call or, or happened like in, in the hours or days after, but I remember that feeling of swallowing the big pill of recognizing that all of these years, all of these fucking years, 40 years at that time, 40 years I had spent, not 40, I was 40 years old, but I hadn't I start, I didn't start when I was zero. So let's say like 30 years, maybe 25 years at least. I'd spent being unhappy and unsuccessful to prove that my parents did me wrong. I, I'm unhappy and unsuccessful because my parents didn't blah, 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 right? Didn't see me, love me, treat me, give me the right opportunity. They did fucking amazing, by the way. <laughs> like when I think back, they just, just fucking incredible. Anyway, but I had the story in my head and, you know, I couldn't be happy and successful. If I was happy and successful, like what, what did they, like, what could I pin on them, right? Like I would have nothing to blame them for. So I needed to keep myself really unhappy and really unsuccessful in order to keep blaming, blaming my parents. And it was really a big freaking pill to swallow that, that all of this misery that I've created for myself for so many years was all my doing. 
all my doing and I could have stopped it anytime I wanted to. But I was like, okay, there are only two ways here, right? Either I just stay in my misery or I swallow this damn pill and I, I move on and, and I swallowed the pill. But then here we are like some eight, nine years later and I, I just discovered this whole other layer to it that I wasn't, that I wasn't seeing before. Yeah. Do you think that we default to victim like naturally or is it something no. from a, a from a trauma well, that we've had so i think so i think there is i think there's something inherent in us that has that going you know i don't think we're born into the world with it right i do think that there's some ancestral archetypes like shweta would i'm sure would agree with me on right um but that that we might inherit some patterns from our ancestors etc but but here's the way I think about it is so, so the drama triangle of the victim, the victim and the villain and the rescuer is universal in all storytelling, right? All stories all have a protagonist and an antagonist and then this helper persona. Every single story, like every Disney movie, every major, like they all have that. So there's something inherent in us, deep in our, you know, mental, neuro, whatever, programming, DNA, I don't know what the hell. There's something in us that, that has that structure already built in. And the protagonist, antagonist, and helper is the exact same thing as victim, villain, and rescuer, right? It's the same framework. We're just giving it different names and using it, you know, for different purposes, but it's the same damn thing. So I think it's wired within us. I also think it's very much a learned behavior. It's learned, inherited, it, not genetically, but through upbringing where maybe we learned that we got attention when we were sick, when we were down, when we were, when we were helpless, right? We tend to reward people who are in, in a victim state versus rewarding people who step out of victim and into being a creator. That's my answer. So this victim part of me, when it comes to marketing, and actually I had my hands I've had my hands read multiple times using this International Institute of Hand Analysis system from a guy named Richard Unger. I've had Beth Davis read me. I've had Nana Rebecca read me. I've had Pamela Landers read me. And then a couple months ago, I had uh, Richard Unger himself read me. He said, based on, he read my prints actually a little bit differently, meaning he saw some different patterns in my, in my prints. He said that my life lesson, which means you know, my blind spot, the thing that the struggle that I come up against all the time, it, especially when I'm when I'm trying looking to grow, that that is actually persuasion reluctance, that I'm reluctant to persuade people about things right to to sell them on stuff versus uh, what I've been told to previously is like, am I worthy of love? They're related, but not exactly the same, obviously. So there might be something deep in me that has that like, persuasion reluctance there but i in in 2008 specifically at the end of 2008 that was when i got started in online marketing i would buy these these courses about how to do various online marketing and, and i just go freaking execute it i just do the thing and it freaking worked and you know i would make sales and that was the moment like that i knew that i could make enough money to live on from online course stuff to never have to, you know, work for, for like do programming for money again, which is what I did before that. And it was super exhilarating. And then like, and there'd be pushback. There'd be people like, it's like, this is too American. This is too, too, too much. And like, I don't know, like, I'm like, yeah, fine, whatever. It didn't bother me. And I'm like, fine. Yeah. You can have, you can have your opinions. I know that like, this is, I'm fine with this, but there's one guy, he was a designer. He's someone that, that I deeply respected. I wanted his admiration. I wanted his approval, this guy. I still know him to this day. He's a good guy, he's a great guy. So he was from that tech entrepreneurial community where I'd always kind of felt like I wanted to belong, but I couldn't really fit in and it was weird. And, and, and he, was, he was one of the guys that I desperately wanted to approve of me. And we were at a conference together and he pulls up on his phone a sales page for a campaign that I was doing at the point at the time. And he was on my email list for some reason. And he showed it to me and he's like, is this you? Like, is this really, are you serious? Like, is this what you do? Cause that type of marketing is so outside the norms of what like 
that kind of tech community tends to do. And it really hit me and it really shut me down. And like, in some ways I never recovered from that. Like it hit me, this was in 2010, it hit me so fucking deep that I think part of that was still in that victim that I just uncover, right? So it's kind of crazy how when you really hit these, some of these like core, core wounds that it can really like, God damn, it can really kind of trigger something quite deep, big deal. I think it's gonna be freaking game changing for how we do hiring, how we do marketing. Like it's gonna, I mean, it's already changed so much in how I operate. I think you're gonna see this one being a, a major shift as well. Last year, when I sort of really got under my, my birth trauma, that was a major freaking shift. And those who've been following for a while can see how different what we do on the product side these days is from what we've ever done. This is, is a similar kind of shift on the marketing, customer acquisition side, and the, um, as well as on the team side. It's gonna be a, a similar kind of seismic shift. So I'm really, I'm really pumped about that. I'm really excited about it. You know, I think it's really cool just having a view on the inside, looking out to see how the company grows and as you grow and develop. And you've said this before, and I think this is the title of your upcoming book, You Are the Product. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just like literally the as you hit these plateaus, not plateaus, but as you hit these new levels, then it unlocks something in the company, it unlocks a genius, it unlocks a brilliance, it unlocks uh, a new pathway for potential that I think is just really amazing. And it's, it's very encouraging uh, to yeah. know that, you know what, we are the barometer <laughs> of our own selves. And if we can kind of get beyond that, then we can continue to, to blossom and bloom. Yeah, it, it really is. And I, I like, dude, I would love to figure out a way to, you know, hire people who are able to kind of expand the company in ways that go beyond uh, my capacity, but I haven't figured that out. And I don't know to what extent that's really possible, right? Like, cause I have to, it has to be a possibility for me. I would love to find a way to have people hire people who are able to trigger that growth in me more effectively, right? Who can give me that pushback, that resistance, that whatever I need. So it, it creates that friction that then causes these, you know, leaps and growth. So I can be like, okay, clearly something here that I need to work on. Let's like, let's get to work on it. Haven't been able to quite figure that out yet either. The strengths and the limitations of the leader is so impactful. And it really is probably even at the highest level, right? Like if you look at Elon Musk and his companies, if you look at Jeff Bezos and Amazon, if you look at, you know, Apple and Steve Jobs and Tim Cook and you know, Google and Alphabet and whoever the hell is in charge of a Sunday. The guy in charge just has such an outsized effect on the, the kind of the vibe and the feel and the potential of the company. Like even look at Disney and, and, you know, Bob Iger and then whatever the new guy was and then Bob Iger coming back in and like all that, all that drama. Really the personality of the leader ends up having this like massive impact. And I think it's just, that's just how it is. It's, it's, it's how it's supposed to be. I love taking that growth. That's where the leaps happen, right? Do you think it's possible to have these level of breakthroughs, particularly exploring the victim persona without a cataclysmic event to trigger it <laughs> like does it have to be negative 125 165 you know looming threat for us to be able to have these moments or can we systematize it yeah i think we i mean i think we can definitely be like be better at listening to the more subtle stuff and be better at looking at you know acknowledging that i but i don't i don't know like i spoke with debbie ford years ago some of you may remember her she passed away you know a while back she had the story of she was one of the early people in the self-help world she was you know big on oprah kind of came came in at around the same time as deepak chopra became a thing etc her story was that she was a drug addict and she was in rehab and finally one day she was like just in the bathroom she was not religious but she broke down on the bathroom floor and just started praying to god 
And she got this like big a revelation in that moment, that big kind of breakthrough. And I remember asking her, like, do you have to, like, do you have to have something like deep crisis like that, like being a drug addict and like really being in deep trouble like that in order to have these kinds of breakthroughs? And her answer was, I don't think that you need to, but it really helps. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't think you need to. I really don't. I think it's, you know, first you get tickled with a feather and then like it gets more and more aggressive until like, you just keep not listening. Then eventually they're going to smack you with a sledgehammer, right? So I think it's more, more of that nature, but it's great because, you know, whenever those big things happen, you can just really know up front, this is going to be amazing. Why? Oh my God, like what kind of incredible breakthrough is going to happen on the other side of this? Like, and I was doing, while I was doing this, I was doing lots of other practical things. I've actually, I had already had my finances team, like make me a list of all recurring payments of any, any kind, right? Monthly, quarterly, annually, or just irregular. And so immediately found like $7,000 a month that we can call and just like savings in that way. And like all kinds of other things that, that, that came out of it. But yeah, the big thing was the inner. Um, so yeah, so you can go into whatever challenges with a mindset of like, this is exciting. It's gonna happen on the other side, way. Then that completely changes the dynamic of it. And I think also like when we approach it with that you know level of curiosity and openness, our, our subconscious is gonna be more forthcoming with those nudges that we need to grow. And when I look at my life, like for all the success that I've had and, and, and everything that I've become in the process of all this, I have so far still to go of where I want to be with all areas of my life, health, wealth, and relationships. And on that note, I was speaking to one of my health advisors. She was encouraging me to, to drink these um, different kinds of uh, juice shots that are designed to have a specific psychological effect. And then she's like, you want, I want you to make a batch in the morning and then have a shot three times during the day. And then each time you have a shot, you sit down for 15 minutes and you meditate and you really feel into what is this actually doing with me and like really looking for those subtle things. And it just reminded me of how there are lots of things where like, my wife will sometimes be making me these shots or these other th like, different things. And she's like, how did you feel when you had that? And I'm like, I have no idea. Cause I wasn't, I was just all in my head. I wasn't paying attention to it. Right. And it's not that I don't have the capacity to feel it. It's that I'm just like so busy. Like, it's funny. Like you're, when you, when you look at people from the outside, I was in the theater, like this is a while back. I was in the theater and I was just looking around at everybody in that theater and everybody's just sitting there like, paralyzed right you sit in these super uncomfortable chairs and you have to sit still and they're all tight together because they pack everybody in and everybody's just, like sitting there just like passively consuming the shit and, like and you're like this is fucking crazy like why are we doing that it's like it's wild that, that we humans do this but that's what happens when we're so focused on like our heads and what's coming in through our eyes and ears and we're just like and it doesn't appear weird to us but really looking from the outside, it kind of is weird. All right, cool. Thank you, everybody. Uh, such a pleasure to be with you today. I'll see you guys all next week, same time, same place. All right, cheers. Thank you all. Bye-bye.